Let's open our Bibles to Ephesians in the fourth chapter. And today I want to talk to you about the truth factor. Coming down to church this morning, I was listening on a, a Christian radio station and the song was playing. It had these uh, words to it. It says, tell me once again who I am to you, who I am to you. Tell me lest I forget who I am to you. And this is an appeal of the person saying, Lord, now speak to me about who I really am to you. Tell me, I don't want to forget. And well, the Lord makes it abundantly clear who the follower of Christ is. He said, you're my child. You belong to me. I have you in my keeping. And he gives not only our identity in Christ, but he stresses, here's what I want for you as my child. I want you growing in your relationship with me. I'm just intrigued as I read through Ephesians chapter 4, and we've been going through this uh, series of studies, how detailed the Apostle Paul is in this teaching about growing in your relationship with Christ and maturing as a believer. It is central to him. It certainly is with the Lord. That's the Lord's intent for our lives. But the Apostle Paul, he is just immersed in this teaching, and he stresses this over and again to believers, the importance of growing in your life with Christ. And he talks to us, as we've seen in dealing with this particular subject, he is uh, stressed to us. He said, this comes about, there must be unity in the faith. You cannot draw apart from other believers, and there needs to be unity on basic teachings of the faith if we're going to grow. And then he talks about our knowledge of the Son of God must increase regularly. Certainly that's true. But then he goes on and he says things like this. He said, you've got to put off the old self, this sin nature that's within you that does not leave you when you accept Christ. He said, you lay it aside in the sense that you don't allow that to control you anymore. And you put on the new self. And then after he underscores that for us, he talks about what we discussed last week. What can prevent a believer from having their life changed? When we accept Christ, there is going to be some change, but it can be minimal if the believer falls into the trap that he speaks against here, and that's futility in thinking. And he said, you've just got to guard yourselves in, in your thought processes. And he said, if you get to a place where you start being real confused in your thinking, and uh, you, you get into things like this where you want explanations for all your troubles, which you won't have, or you live, uh, think I'm going to be a person of reason, and if I can't explain something, then I won't believe it. Well, then certainly you're not going to believe many of the teachings of the Bible. Or if you get into this, if it feels good or it feels right to me, then, then it must be okay. Well, no, things can feel good and can feel right to you that are not okay at all according to the Lord. And he says, all that's futility of thought. He said, you've got to turn away from that. Now, when I look at all those teachings, you would just think, well, the Apostle Paul has exhausted what he needs to say on this subject. But he hasn't. He is so thorough. Now he gets into specific areas of thought where he says, believers, here's where you need to concern yourself. Here are areas that you need to guard within your life. And today we're going to look at just one of them. It's what he says in verse 25. Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 25, and this is all about the truth factor. He says this, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. But he says you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. Well now there are different things we want to consider when we think about truthfulness today. One is this, why, why do people lie? Why does a person, why would they do this? Well, the answer just in one word is to deceive. You just deceive people. That's what you want to do. That's why you would lie. And there can be different reasons for wanting to deceive individuals. You might be wanting to cover up some sin within your life. And so you're deceiving them about how you really are as a person. Or it could be this, you want to take advantage of people. And you tell them a lie to try and gain benefit for yourself. And Bernie Madoff, this gentleman a few years ago, just built people out of millions and millions of dollars. He just told them a lie to gain for himself, to take advantage for himself. And what a tragedy that was. Or it might be this, to make yourself look better. 
in the public's eye. And the Pharisees, they were notorious for this. Jesus, when he made statements to the religious leaders, he, he was so harsh to them. He was more stern in his remarks to religious leaders than he was to anyone else. I did a funeral here recently, and I made a comment that the son of the gentleman who'd passed away had said, my father is not religious. I said, well, that's great, because some of the meanest people in the world are religious. Some of the biggest fakes in the world are religious. And his father knew Christ as his Savior, and he had this relationship, and that's much more important. But Jesus, when he talks about these Pharisees, he makes statements in Matthew chapter 23. He said, they tie up heavy loads and put them on the shoulders of men. They themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. They love the places of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogue. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces and to have men call them rabbi. They're all into that. They love to tell people how to live, but they don't live like that. But they put on this show wanting to make people think better about them, and they're just deceiving them. They're lying to them. So basically, reasons like that, but it's all points to deception. The only reason a person lies is to deceive. Well, secondly, think about this. Being truthful is the way that we help each other grow in our life with Christ and in, in the love of God. Look at this statement in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. He says, instead speaking the truth in love, We will in all things grow up into him who is the head. Now that growing up into him is not going to take place if we're not communicating truth and living truth. And then he says, from him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. But it all comes back to truth. It all starts with truth. Truth being communicated. uh, Telling each other things that are truthful in our relationships, but telling each other things that are truthful about the Lord. And with that being so, it's important for all of us really to evaluate just how truthful am I? How truthful am I with myself, with the Lord, in my dealings with my family, in my dealings with people? Am I a person who tells the truth? When I'm in school doing my work, am I truthful with that? When I'm in a business, am I truthful about all things that I'm doing? Do I tell that which is accurate or not? Listen, it's so easy, so easy for us to excuse what we would classify as little white lies and think, well, you know, it's not too bad. And everybody does it. It's just a a little white lie. The Bible never excuses this. You and I have to know this. It never excuses lying. Lying is so dangerous. You do not want to get in the habit of this. Uh, Years ago, when I pastored in Gainesville, Texas, my former elementary school teacher, or principal, called me on the phone. His name was Buck Giles. And he said, Bob, I'm going to be in Gainesville. I'd love to come by and visit with you. And I said, well, that'd be great. I hadn't seen him in a long time. And he'd meant a lot to me as a little boy. I remember him. He was there in the school. And so he came over. We had a great visit that day and and shared some things about the past. But he made a statement to me that I'll never forget. Now, here he'd been a principal. He was retired at this time, but he'd been a principal in the school for years. So he dealt with children, with teachers, with parents of children, with people in the community. And he made this statement to me. He said, Bob, I always underscored for the children in the school where I served to tell the truth. Because he said, I've seen this over and again, that if a person can lie, they can do just about anything else. If they can lie, they can just get into anything else. And that's always stood out to me what Mr. Giles said. Now, when I think of that, certainly that leads me to this next thought about the seriousness of lying. Just from a biblical standpoint, you can hear a principle... I hope I didn't cause that. (laughs) And I'm not lying either. I hope I did. 
But when you think about the seriousness of lying, just from a biblical standpoint, you think, well, where really in the Bible does it say that it's just so, so terrible? Well, you notice in this respect, look in Acts chapter 5. Acts the fifth chapter. And we note this, the very first sin that was judged in the early church was the sin of lying. The very first sin that was judged publicly was the sin of lying. Here's this story about this man Ananias and Sapphira. Acts chapter 5, it says this. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. And with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself. But he brought the rest and he put it to the apostles' feet. Now all the other people had been bringing all that they had and placing it at the apostles' feet. And Ananias and Sapphira knew that. But they sold their property and they held back some for themselves and brought the rest. And gave the impression, here's all of it. And it says Simon Peter commented to him, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? And have kept for yourself some of the money that you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied to men, but to God. And when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. And then the young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter asked her, now tell me, is this the price that you and Ananias got for the land? And she said, oh, yes. Yes, it is. That's the price. Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Just look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. And at that moment she fell down at his feet and died and the young men came in and finding her dead carried her out and buried her beside her husband and great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Very first sin judged in the early church, the sin of lying. Listen, when you read that story, that is not to say that, oh my word, if you lie, you're going to die right then. If that's true, we wouldn't have anybody in the worship center today. I mean, we wouldn't be here. In fact, there wouldn't be any church home today. That's not the point, but it is. Sometimes the Lord in his dealings with people will do something dramatic like this to underscore how critical and serious it is to him when people lie to brothers and sisters in Christ and more importantly, lie to him. Because Peter said, you're not lying to men, you're lying to God. And so that certainly points out how very critical this is. Now here's the second reason. When you stop and consider, you see the seriousness when you think who the father, the spiritual father of lies is. Jesus said in John chapter 8 verse 44, he said, Satan is. Here were people who were religious people and they were saying to him, God is our father. And Jesus said, no, he's not. He said, your father is Satan. And he said, your father was a liar from the very beginning. And you read in the book of Genesis, you don't have to read very far in the Bible. You just start reading a little bit. And you get to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. And this uh, story unfolds before us. And it says, there was the serpent more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Satan is in this, doing this. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the servant, well, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not even touch it or you will die. And here's what the serpent comes back and says, well, you're not going to die. That's not true. God knows that when you partake of that tree, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. And so he accused God of being a liar and then he lied himself to Eve. 
And Eve, it says, when she saw the fruit of the tree, that it was good for food and pleasing to the eye. Remember that thought thing? If it looks good, if it feels good, seems right to me. Well, all that came into play with Eve. And she bought into this lie and she partook of that tree and so did her husband Adam. And the Bible says they died, not physically, not at that moment. They would have to die later, but they died spiritually. They were separated from God because of their sin. But it was all brought about because of a lie. Now, we have to understand, here's the the spiritual father of lies. It's Satan. So when I'm lying, then I'm under his influence. I'm not under the influence of the Spirit of God. And then there's a third way you see the seriousness of this. It's when you think about the eternal results. Now, we've just been in the first book of the Bible, the last chapter in the Bible, Revelation chapter 22. In verse 15 and verse 14, this statement is made. Verse 14, blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. And they don't wash them themselves. Jesus cleanses them. But then it says this outside. These people don't get in. Are the dogs. Those who practice magic arts. The sexually immoral. The murderers. The idolaters. And everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Now, once again, that does mean if a person has committed one of those sins that they will never be saved because there are people who have lived in those sins and yet they meet Christ as their Savior and they're changed and they're forgiven and they go to heaven. What he's saying in that passage is that a person who gives their life to these things, regardless of what that sin might be, if they give their lives to those things, then they've never met Christ. And he says they're just sealing their own faith, their eternal fate. And it's one of disaster. He said they're on the outside. They'll never be in God's kingdom. And the very last one, it's just interesting. When you start thinking about the seriousness of lying, he says those who love and practice falsehood. If that characterizes their life, that's what they give of themselves to. It's a clear indication they've never met Christ as their Savior. So all of that points out just how serious this issue of lying is. But now let's think about this The worst lie are lies that a person can tell. It has to do with Jesus Christ. It's what they say about him. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, it talks about those who deny that Jesus is the Christ. And that's one lie that you can tell about Jesus. Now listen, lost people lie all the time about Jesus. But believers can also in certain ways. And I'll show you, but what's... What's the danger in this and what's tragic about it? Well, when someone lies about the Lord Jesus Christ, they misrepresent him to the world. They totally paint a different picture as to what Jesus Christ is all about. And the people in the world, it just confuses them. And lost people do this. There was a lady. She is a professor in an Ivy League school. And after this verdict came out about in this Zimmerman trial this week, this lady comes out professor in a school. And makes a statement. Uh, The God of America is a white racist. God is not good all the time. And he is not my God. Now when you hear that, I don't know what that makes you feel. But inside for me, that just made me feel real sad for this woman. I thought, lady, you're you're in total, total state of confusion and spiritual darkness. And here's a professor. It's supposedly a prominent school making the statement, God is a white racist. I'm going, this is absurd. The trial didn't have anything to do with a Caucasian. It was people of other races. And yet you're calling God a white racist. And you're saying God is not good all the time. And you're saying he's not by God. And you do have that right. He's not your God, obviously. But I mean, to make those statements, and unfortunately, they're going to be students at that Ivy League campus, and there'll be people who hear remarks like that, and they're upset about things that have gone on, and they may buy into some of that. You start making statements about the Lord that are not true, you misrepresent Him to other people. And that is that it's extremely dangerous. When people do that, you, you lead people away. Jesus said about these 
Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23. Just listen to a couple of passages that he stated. It, it was tragic. Here they told things that were not truthful about the Lord. And here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 23 in verses 13 through 15. Jesus said this, Woe to you, you teachers of the law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. Listen to that. Shut the kingdom of heaven. We're trying to tell people the way is open. You can know Christ. You've got to tell them the truth for them to understand that. You tell them lies and you're doing exactly what these, these hypocrites did. He said, you shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. But you just lead people away as you misrepresent Christ. Here's something else that's tragic about this. You're serving Satan rather than Christ. Now, lost people, yes, we would know that to be true. But again, I'll show you an illustration here in a moment about believers, how believers can say things that are not true about the Lord Jesus. And when we do that, we not only misrepresent the Lord Jesus, but we're, we're under the influence of Satan when we do that. It says the Rhea Philippi in Matthew 16 when Jesus is with the disciples and he's asking them, who do people say that I am? I mean, what's the scuttlebutt going around about me? And they say, well, Lord, some say you're Elijah, some say you're John the Baptist. Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter just jumps right up, steps up to the plate and says, well, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father who is in heaven. So that was wonderful. Just a little bit later, Jesus begins to explain to them, that I'm going to be going to Jerusalem. I'll be turned over to the authorities. They're going to beat me. They're going to spit on me. And they're going to crucify me. And then I will rise from the grave. It was like they forgot the last part. And Simon Peter, he immediately goes face to face with Jesus. And he begins to dispute the Lord. And he begins to say to him, no, no, this won't happen. We can't have this. And what did Jesus say to him? He didn't go, well, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood has not revealed this, but my father's. No, not then. When Peter is speaking against what Christ declared to be truth, Jesus said this to him, get thee behind me, Satan. And Simon Peter was under the influence of Satan at that time. And you and I have to understand this. That's why you better be careful things you say about Christ. We start saying things that are against what he reveals as being truthful. It's extremely bad because we are under the influence of Satan when that happens. And then there's this. Just for the individual, especially this pertains just to the lost person, when they do this, they will not acknowledge truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. They're, they're in a position where it's like they seal their own fate. They come to a place where they make comments to the effect, I, don't, I, I just don't buy this that Jesus Christ is God. He may be better than we are, but I don't believe he's God. I don't believe that business about any kind of virgin birth. As far as a, his death on a cross, taking care of problems, sins of the world, I mean, I can't feature that. I mean, he's beaten to a pulp unmercifully, died a horrible death, just like thousands of people. I mean, don't tell me that. I don't buy that. I don't think Jesus Christ is the only way to be saved. I don't think I have to trust in him to go to heaven. I think if I do a lot of good deeds, that'll, that'll cover it for me. You deny truth in that respect and get to a place like that, people like that will not accept Christ into their life. And they, they absolutely just seal their own fate. The Bible says Jesus taught this in John chapter 3. He said, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He said, whosoever believes in him, who he is and what he did and what he said, whoever believes in him, yields their life to him, they are not condemned. But then he says this, whoever does not believe is condemned 
already. They've just done it to themselves. All because they lied about what Christ is and they bought into things that were untruthful. And then one final thing, and this is particularly to believers, and this is not in your notes. But believers, you think, well, now, what kind of lie would a believer? A believer wouldn't say that Jesus is not the Savior. No, they wouldn't say he's not the Savior. And sometimes believers can get to a place where they say, well, I believe God is so big-hearted. I believe God has other means of saving people other than Jesus. That's a lie. Believe it, that's a lie. You may fancy yourself as being big-hearted and open-minded by saying that. That is a lie. That is a dangerous lie. Or what about this in their life? They have needs come up in their life and these needs aren't being met just immediately and they start thinking to themselves and buying into this notion, I don't know if he's going to meet my needs. I mean, it seems I just struggle one thing after another comes my way and I don't see him meeting my needs. Or you start telling yourself and communicating to other people, I don't believe, I don't know that he really cares that much about me. And I think maybe he may love me some, but I don't know that he loves me that much because of things I'm going through and troubles my family's having. I just don't know about that. And what about death? When death comes knocking at someone's door, someone that you love and you care for, and you start getting in your mind different thoughts, I don't, I don't know. Is there life after death? And uh, are we really with him? Or are we just out there by ourselves if there is life after death? Or is this, some will tell you soul sleep. You start buying into that. Well, I just believe maybe a person's just in the grave there. That's where they are. And you listen to that and you start accepting that. Every bit of that is absolutely false. As far as our needs in life, Jesus makes this promise in Matthew chapter, chapter 6. He said, listen, the birds of the air are taken care of. The flowers of the field are clothed greater than Solomon in all his splendor. He said, don't you think your Father in heaven will concern himself more with you than he does with those things? He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. Jesus said, I will take care of your needs. He's not going to supply your every want, but he'll take care of your every need. That's his promise. That's truth. He stands and tells us himself about death. That the person who lives and believes in me will never die. Physically they will, but they continue to live. Those come straight from the word the mouth of Christ. He said to the thief that repented that day on the cross, today you are fixing to be with me in paradise. Your body won't be, but you will be. And yet here believers that don't get into this and they don't buy into it, well, here's what happens to them. They become extremely disillusioned and full of despair. I mean, you can grieve in ways that you shouldn't be grieving and that's not the Lord's intent for you. But you lie about what Christ says is truthful as a believer. And you can be overwhelmed with despair. And no wonder there's so many believers walking around who if you get with them and talk with them, they're totally joyless in their life and don't have hope. And it's their own doing because they won't believe the truth of God's word. So there's one thing that can occur. And here's the other thing. You start lying and not believing what the Lord says is truth in his word. And your prayers are rendered useless. You say, well, now, where do you get that? Well, look over here in James. James in chapter 1. James is writing believers. James is the pastor of the church of Jerusalem. And James makes this statement. James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. You're a believer. Ask your father who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given unto him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded unstable in all that he does. But you see a little statement in there? That one who doubts, that one who may ask, but they don't believe. He says that man 
will not receive anything from the Lord. And some people wonder, well, why, why don't my prayers, why don't I have power in my prayers? Well, I would ask you, just what do you believe about Christ and about His Word? Do you believe what He says about how He'll take care of you, how He'll provide for you, how He's with you, how He'll help you? Do you believe the truth in His Word? Or have you gotten off into some tangent of thought where you deny so much of what He says in His Word? If you get away from truthfulness and lie about Him as a believer, that puts you in that position. And that's a position none of us want to be in. You know, I read that and I just think, here, we've sung this song about freedom and seen this little video. We can be free. We can be free. We can be liberated. We can have God's power flowing in our lives in just abundant ways if we believe truth about Him. It's all about truth. All about truth. So no wonder the Apostle Paul, when he gets down to these specific issues, here we're talking about maturity, putting off the old, putting on the new. He says, here's specific areas you need to look out for. And the very first one he starts with is this, truthfulness. You've got to be truthful. And the way you tell people about life, life issues, be truthful. And that especially what you communicate and what you believe about Christ, you've got to accept what he says is truth. If you do not, you just put yourself in that weakened position. Remember, Jesus said this, John chapter 8, verse 30, 32. He said, you shall know the truth. It's the truth that will set you free. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Well, Father, this is such a simple subject. We all as parents and grandparents would tell our children... Now, let's tell the truth. And yet, Father, so often we can just fall into traps where we don't tell the truth. And we can lie to other people for different reasons. But, Lord, worst of all, the worst thing we can do is just lie to ourselves and lie to others about you. The Lord Jesus, you've revealed what is truthful within your word about yourself and about us. And, Father, help us not to deviate from what you say. It helps forget about what the culture says, what everybody else is saying. Help us to be concerned about what you're saying and to believe your word and to trust your word and to accept your truth. And Father, I pray this morning, there may be uh, people sitting right here, maybe many in here, who have never made that personal discovery of the Lord Jesus, never received him as their son. Maybe they're religious, but they don't have a clue about a relationship with you because they have never yielded their life to you. I pray for them and just pray right now in these moments. And as we preach this sermon, I pray you'd speak to their hearts. And Father, help them. Help them in making this most important decision to receive Jesus. And Father, if there are believers in here or anyone who they know lying characterizes them more than truth does, Father, I pray you break their heart over that. And help them to repent of that and turn from that. And Lord Jesus, I ask this in your name. While our heads are still bowed and our eyes are closed, we'll be dismissed in a moment. But listen, service not over. This may be the most important time in the service right now. And as soon as we have this song, and people will be fellowshipping, some will be leaving, it's time where you can do business with God. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, you can do that right now. If you'd like to, I'm going to be standing right here at the front. There'll be some other people down here to help. But we'd be glad to talk to you, privileged to talk to you, and share with you how you can receive Christ as your Savior. If you need to make that decision, I hope you'll come and express that because you can meet Christ today. If you're someone that this has been a real issue in your life, and it is right now, and you know it is, you may be lying to your family, to your kids, to people you work with, Listen, you don't have to come down here and tell me about that, but you sure need to tell the Lord about that and seek the Lord and ask Him to give you deliverance from it. And it may be that you're a believer just looking for a church home, a place where you can serve Christ, and you'd like to be involved here. You come forward. We'd love to tell you how you can be a part, and we'd love to have you here.